welcome to our webinar, Collaborations, Circular Economy and Climate Change. I'm Heather Ratche, part of the marketing team um, at Interface, and I'm joined with my colleague Lorraine Thompson, um, and we'll be hosting today's session. Um, before I hand over to Lorraine uh, for the main presentations, I've just got a little bit of housekeeping for you. Um, so to ask questions, please use the chat functionality and you can ask those throughout um, the presentations and we will come to those um, at the end of the session. The webinar is being recorded uh, and will be available online afterwards. Um, just to note that this event is uh, an official event of VentureFest, um, which is an annual um, festival of discovery and innovation, which brings together events that inspire and support innovation um, the innovation journey and helping to create a more visionary and global business that embrace the possibilities of tomorrow. And you can find out more about the VentureFest event on the Interfaith website. So I'll now hand over to Lorraine to introduce today's webinar and our guest speakers. Um, and I hope you're up for some good discussion this morning. Over to you, Lorraine. Oh, just going to unmute you, my Lorraine. There you go. Thank you, Heather. Um, we're delighted to be joined today by our speakers, Michael Forbes from Renewable Parts and Professor Jonathan Courtney of the University of Strathclyde. So going back a little bit, back to 20, 2016, through a referral from Highlands and Islands Enterprise into Interface, we supported Renewable Parts to identify an academic partner, in this case, Strathclyde, to help them develop an innovation program to look at the remanufacture and repair of wind turbine parts as opposed to always having them replaced uh, as new. So today, Michael and Jonathan will talk us through their individual organisations. We'll also discuss their actual collaboration and the circular economy before we open the floor to questions. But firstly, a little bit of background to today's webinar theme and to interface. This month marks one year until COP26, the UN Climate Change Conference that will take place in Glasgow that should, of course, have been happening this month. But at the recent countdown to COP26 event, collaboration was a recurring theme pretty much amongst all the panel sessions as being a key approach to addressing climate change challenges. Collaboration was also mentioned as a key catalyst in the contribution to the circular economy opportunity to open the door to new products and services. For those that are not aware of Interface, if we change our slide, thank you, Heather. We act as a matchmaker between businesses and universities. And as champions of collaboration, we really set this webinar up as an opportunity to demonstrate some of what's already being done around these themes that will hopefully act as a source of inspiration and also a resource for others who may be keen to, to do and see what's possible. The service that we provide is free. And that's not only to companies, but it's also to organisations such as public, private sector and third sector, also individuals of all sizes across every sector across the whole country and matching them not just to Scotland's universities, but also to colleges and research institutes, because we're lucky enough to have world leading um, expertise uh, across our academia. And that can also be for any any subject. So whilst universities teach and carry out research, they're very, very keen on applied research, looking into an idea or a challenge that somebody has, researching a solution, but making sure that it's very practical to implement. Our concept isn't new. We've been on the go now for 15 years, and in that time, we've managed to reach over 3,000 businesses and got over 2,400 projects with an academic partner off the ground. And this map shows the geographical locations of many of these projects that we've helped to, to broker. Um, our team is also located at different points throughout Scotland. And the aim of that is so that we get to know the areas better and also get to know the businesses better. So the projects that we've brokered have been, as I say, across all sorts of disciplines and themes, but amongst them, they've supported new product development, access to new markets, new processes, they've managed to increase revenue and profits for organisations that have undertaken them, but also maybe particularly importantly, just now in the circumstances we find ourselves, they've also helped organisations find new ways of doing things. We can also provide advice and support on a range of funding programmes to help offset the cost of these projects. 
whilst our service is free to find a partner, there may be some costs involved in the actual, in the actual collaboration once you've got that up and running. So the long-standing innovation voucher programme that is uh, looking at the development of a new product process or service. And for that, which is applied for with your organisation and a university, once you've found a partner, that can draw down up to £5,000 of support that would go to the university to do the project, but doesn't need a cash input from yourselves. The second sort of newer voucher scheme is the Workforce Innovation Voucher. Again, the same value, £5,000 that would cover the cost of a, of a collaboration, but that's a more inward looking innovation. That's looking at your workforce um, and how that can be increased in terms of its effectiveness and productivity. So what can be done differently to do more within your workforce to achieve more? Um, the good thing about these schemes is that they can be um, cover the cost of a small scale collaboration, but they could be a start of a much longer journey. And I think what we'll find here with Renewable Parts is that their journey with Strathclyde certainly has been long and certainly very fruitful since the origins back in 2016. So perhaps inspired by today, you might be keen to find out more about not just our matchmaking service, but also the funding that we can point you in the direction of. So what I'll do now, after that very quick introduction, is I'll hand over to Michael to tell you more about Renewable Parts and their story. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me. Okay. I'm sorry for any uh, delays in the in the feed. Uh, I've had to turn my camera off for quite a poor signal here. Um, my name is Michael Forbes and I run the Refurbishment Centre for Renewable Parts. Um, the Refurbishment Centre is based in Loch in the west coast of Scotland. Um, business was started uh, almost 10 years ago uh, and at the time the business was called Recycled Renewables and the business has gone full circle so to speak. It's become a supply chain management business based in Glasgow but uh, recently the refurbishment centre opened uh, back on the west coast of Scotland on Loch um, to recirculate used parts within the wind industry. I'm going to talk uh, just a bit about what we're doing there and the collaborations we've carried out. Uh, next slide. So the first question is why buy refurbished? So for the wind industry, this is uh, quite a big one. Um, the priority always was, uh, certainly up until around about 18 months ago, the price and lead time. So the refurbished parts are generally uh, considerably cheaper than new, and also they're normally on the shelf, whereas new parts can be quite expensive and also have fairly long lead times up to four months. Um, so the price and lead time is always the biggest factor. We started selling refurbished parts. It was always the first thing asked. It was always the, the bit that was negotiated the most. Um, but over the last 18 months, we've seen a, a big shift from uh, some of our main customers and more and more of them are now looking at buying refurbished uh, or to improve their, their carbon footprint rather than to cut costs. And it's been a, a really big shift in this. Um, so now the price and lead time is still important, but more and more customers asking uh, what capability we have for the parts uh, because they're keeping engaged with one another. Um, finally, you would expect the refurbished parts to be as good as new. You would expect that in uh, any industry. In the wind industry is particularly important because you don't want a uh, part to fail. So you would expect it to be as good as new, but if our refurbished parts were working where possible better than new and whether that's with improved warranties, it could be with improved design or it could be right down to improved packaging and means of transport, uh, which is part of that new. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so I would imagine most people that are logged on here have seen this diagram before the circular economy. It's something that's been spoken about uh, a lot, uh, especially in the last year. Um, this is something we are heavily involved in. We're trying to introduce our economy to the wind industry. Um, I think in this diagram a number of times, the one thing that's important to stress is that um, nobody would ever debate that recycling is a good thing. It's obviously a good thing, but in this instance, recycling is the second worst option for landfills. So uh, the, the smaller you can keep these loops, the better. So if a part can be kept in situ and repaired, that's the ideal scenario as far as a carbon footprint is concerned. Uh, 
uh, the next step out from that go from refurbish, refurbishment to uh, remanufacturing, parts harvesting, uh, and the big one, like I say, uh, carries the biggest carbon footprint. Okay, next slide, please. I'm going to talk about how we've uh, helped to create a circular economy in the, the UK wind industry. Uh, we've been uh, refurbishing parts now for around about three years. Uh, for the last two years, at uh, scale, and certainly within the last year, uh, the volume of, uh, of material that's managed to avoid landfill or scrap. Next slide, please. So how does it work? The refurbishment process uh, is important to say it's uh, is not repair. We, we try to avoid the word repair, uh, which suggests that we uh, repair a single part of the refurbishment process. The part is fully refurbished. Uh, it comes with a, a warranty that matches that of new. Um, we have one or two customers who have had some trouble uh, understanding the concept uh, of buying refurbished, uh, but the important thing to know is that when you buy refurbished, you're buying not the same part back. The part you get is likely to have a different serial number. It's going to be a part. Sometimes in uh, the automotive industry with the uh, start motors or alternators. Uh, and the idea is that it's the way to make it scalable. So. If we were repairing parts uh, in order to scale that up, it would be very, very tricky. I don't know what's going to come in next. Whereas if we're refurbishing parts, all the stuff that's coming in the door is going to be refurbished and it's going to go back to stock. Uh, and the next lot of feedstock will come in after sale. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the, the key enabler for the circular economy is the reverse logistics, and I think it goes for, for most other industries as well, but the reverse logistics in this case has been particularly difficult for us. Um, the problem we have is that the people we deal with in selling refurbished parts are generally the procurement department or customer, um, but the person in the procurement department isn't going to be the person who packages the old part. In fact, this is a job that a didn't exist before. It's not something the company had to do. Uh, in most cases, the uh, the site technicians at the wind farm site don't have packaging materials and they don't have lifting gear. Um, so for them, this can be a, a huge headache. It's something beforehand. This is parts that were considered to be scrapped. It didn't matter how they were handled or treated. They could be just put in ships. Base carrier. Now we're asking them to package them up to send and uh, arrange transport. So to help with that, we have created custom packaging uh, for a lot of the parts, uh, reusable packaging. Uh, and it's the case that when this packaging turns up with this, it so we try to make it as simple as possible for everybody involved. So, there isn't anybody in the chain that loses it out because of the uh, adoption of a circular economy. Next slide, please. So looking at the refurbishment process now, um, so this is a uh, we actually do on the parts. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so right, recirculation is the key. So um, I think you we okay? might have lost Michael. Are you still there, Michael? Can you hear us? 
OK, what we might do, I think we might have just lost Michael's sound. Um, if that's all right, Jonathan, if we could cut to your presentation, if that would be OK. Yeah, that, that's good of me. OK, um, thank is, you. Is Michael coming back? Yeah. Shall I just start from the... Carry on, yeah. Go for it, Michael. Thank you. Okay, you can see and hear? Yes, we can, yeah. Okay, so um, we'll have a, a short interlude uh, and continue Michael's presentation in a few minutes. I'm just gonna say a few words about the background to the, the Scottish Institute of Remanufacture, um, explain it's, uh, it's where we came from and what we do very quickly. Um, and when I, was thinking back about how to explain our origins. I thought that actually, in many ways, uh, the centre started 15 years ago, you know, on a sunny morning in South Georgia, because it was here that Ellen MacArthur rested during her round the world uh, voyage and spent some time in the, the ruined whaling facilities of South Georgia. And it was that that um, gave her an epiphany, I think, about how uh, a linear production system was not ultimately going to be sustainable and the world needed to move to a circular um, model. Now, these weren't new ideas and uh, obviously there were established industries already doing remanufacturing, and effectively implementing the circular economy. But as I'll explain in a minute or two, um, what Ellen MacArthur did was popularize the idea. She moved um, an abstract concept from the, the fringes um, to the, the center, to a place where politicians and government um, could easily understand the benefits and appreciate it. Um, she popularized this. So the diagram that we we've all seen so many times of the circular economy. Um, her contribution was the publicity so that people outside industry would see and appreciate what this meant. So we'll come back to Ellen MacArthur's contribution in a second. What I'm going to do is tell you about remanufacturing in Scotland and what the Scottish Institute for Remanufacturing does um, and give you some examples of of the tangible um, projects we've done with different sorts of industry around Scotland. Um, we're based in Strathclyde, uh, but we, we have activities across all um, the Scottish universities. So the first place any talk on remanufacturing starts, and this is still true today as it has, was five years ago, is to emphasize that it's not recycling. You know, uh, remanufacturing is a different process where you're taking usually mechanical, but not always, usually mechanical parts that have been in service and you're refurbishing them. Sometimes that involves cleaning and, um, and minor repairs and replacements. Sometimes it's more major. But ultimately, uh, if you walk around a remanufacturing plant, it's an astonishing process because the parts come out like new, you know, and as Michael said in his presentation, uh, the key, the test, the key t test of um, remanufacturing is whether the warranty is equivalent to the warranty of a new part, but frequently the remanufactured parts are better than the, the new ones because the early life failures have all been removed and sometimes the remanufacturers uh, deliberately replace components that are known to be problematic with better quality. You know, so some we're familiar with a transmissions remanufacturer who claims that his gearboxes are far better than the, the original ones. So the, what a remanufacturing business is doing is introducing a new loop. We're familiar with the, let's say traditional manufacturing process 
where you're going from raw material along the bottom line of this slide through to um, a product that's used and then thrown away. So there's always been elements of reconditioning and repair. Anyone who's owned a car knows that uh, they can be reconditioned and repaired. What the remanufacturing is doing is introducing another set of processes that if you like is um, exploiting better cleaning, better uh, repair and renewal, better testing and measurement to create products that are pretty well indistinguishable from the new ones. Of course, you know, the old loops of uh, recycling and uh, refurbishment are still there and still important. Um, but remanufacture brings with it more benefits than traditional manufacturing. If you think the driver for traditional manufacturing is to make as many parts um, as quickly and cheaply as possible, many products as quickly and cheaply as possible. But a remanufactured part not only provides the same functionality, but actually provides additional benefits for both economic and environmental. So the weight of raw material is saved. The energy is less. In fact, the overall environmental impact is reduced by almost 80% because you're reusing materials that have already been mined, you've already uh, paid energy and carbon costs for their manufacture. Not only that, but it's a, a triple win because the not only does the environment win, but the customer and the manufacturer also win. The customer wins because they get uh, a cheaper product that is equivalent to um, equivalent and functional, functionally equivalent to a new one, but um, at greatly reduced costs and greatly reduced environmental impact. It's also a difficult thing to automate. So associated with all the remanufacturing processes are highly skilled jobs. It's difficult to automate because the parts coming in are not uniform. Parts that have been used are worn and dirty and damaged in different ways. If you think an automated manufacturing system, you know, like the manufacture of cars on a production line, it works because they have large numbers of identical parts all in the same condition. Whereas uh, a remanufacturing process, you need skilled people who are able to assess a part, assess a component, assess a product and decide what course of action is needed. Um, so not only does it provide economic and social, uh, economic and environmental benefits, but also social benefits in terms of uh, highly skilled jobs that are difficult to, to move. So that's the context. Um, and a number of things had to come together about five years ago for the, the formation of the Scottish Institute of Remanufacture. I mentioned Alan MacArthur had, you know, since 2005 been publicizing, popularizing, evangelizing ideas of circular economy. Um, to the point where it had, had reached the ears of civil servants and politicians. So it no longer sounded like a, a crazy idea. The circular economy could be seen as, a, as something that was a respectable, uh, a respectable economic model. Um, industry, of course, have been doing remanufacturing, refurbishment, an overhaul for many years. So in Scotland, we had a government that was listening to ideas of circular economy. In Scotland, we had an industry that was um, both established and new and innovating in areas of circular economy, remanufacturing. And we had an academic infrastructure, Strathclyde and Harriet Watt, um, that could support 
manufacturing processes. We also had, as well as that environment, we also had challenges. So any of the, the businesses involved in remanufacturing and refurbishment will uh, give you a list of challenges that they face. Um, and these range from lack of awareness, uh, negative perceptions, not so much amongst industrial, their industrial customers, but certainly um, amongst the organizations that support industry and business and at the consumer end of products, there's a lack of awareness um, of what remanufacturing could bring. Um, there's always competition. Michael was talking about the supply chain challenges and ultimately many products are not designed to be remanufactured, although they could be. They're designed to uh, be cheaply manufactured. So there's challenges there. However, there's also, as well as challenges, there was also the revelation, I think, that this was already an enormous sector. So when uh, the government started investigating how they could support the circular economy in Scotland, there was a dawning realization that, you know, if you ask someone what the biggest sector, or to list the big industrial sectors in Scotland, they might say oil and gas, or aerospace, or perhaps food. But actually, the remanufacturing uh, industrial sector, are those spread across lots of different domains, you know, energy and aerospace and electronics and transport, um, taken together is enormous, well over a billion pounds by several um, studies employing a lot of people. So it's, I think Americans have, uh, American centers that support remanufacture have referred to it as a sleeping giant. Uh, it's a large industry that never saw itself as an industrial sector. Um, so given that environment, um, back in 2015 uh, with zero waste, with funding from Zero Waste and Scottish Enterprise, uh, um, we were able to launch the uh, Scottish Institute for Remanufacture as a three-way collaboration between industry, academia, and government. And we had, as as ever with these things, uh, many uh, a long uh, a long agenda um, that ranged from building awareness and creating a network both industrial and academic and public sector, um, promoting knowledge exchange, um, identifying industry needs, and what takes most of our time doing industry-driven projects. So we had funding from government to enable collaborative projects between academia and industry that would increase the capacity um, and scale of remanufacturing operations in Scotland. So over the last five years, um, I think we've funded over 40 projects between different companies and different academic groups around Scotland. Um, they range um, across a number of, of subject areas, um, some of which you'd guess, you know, non-destructive inspection, uh, material restoration, verification, process and tools, um, and some which we were surprised at, but um, now with hindsight, we see that actually there's been a constant demand uh, for support developing business models and um, tools. As Michael was saying, you know, reverse logistics, um, doing the, uh, the business model and the uh, predicting the economic benefits of new ventures um, is something that uh, has been needed and requested frequently. So over the last five years, we've worked with um, companies big and small um, to facilitate projects between them and suitable academic partners. Um, I'm going to run through, in a sentence, three or four different projects, because Michael's telling you about um, renewable parts uh, projects but they're only one. Uh, here's another project we did with, uh, we enabled between the electrical engineering department at Strathclyde and Cummins, um, who refurbish 
diesel engines. Uh, part of the refurbishment process was to take out the bearings and replace them because they couldn't, in, they couldn't easily test the bearings to see whether they were very worn and damaged or whether they were good for another 100,000 miles. So this project involved coming up with a non-destructive inspection uh, regime for bearings so that ones that could be used were and others were thrown away instead of throwing away all of them. Here's a project we did for a small company in Glasgow uh, called the Turbo Guy, which was done. So here's a project we funded um, between Harriet Watt researchers and the Turbo Guy in Glasgow, um, who had grown, uh, out, had grown within a facility. So slowly they have become busier and busier and the layout of the facility no longer matched the volume, enabled them to, to process the volume of parts that they, they wanted to. So here the researchers studied how the, the factory unit was laid out, watched the motion of people and materials around the, the facility and came up with a, a better layout that allowed them to um, increase their uh, productivity by 20% and reduce their costs. Is a project done between the design and manufacture department at Strathclyde University and um, what was then uh, Weir Group's Alloa plant that do a lot of um, pump valve refurbishment. Uh, many of these are bespoke items and they needed to constantly recreate um, a test rig to do validation of the refurbished pumps. Um, so here the project was come up with a like a Lego kit for rebuilding uh, test rigs, making it um, easy to reconfigure it. Um, so that you could test things. And then I think finally, um, here's Mackie's uh, transmission refurbisher, again in Glasgow. Um, very similar, the business had grown. Um, they had uh, grown by uh, evolution and they got to the point where they, the layout of the factory didn't allow them to uh, to document um, the flow of materials that are quality that they needed. So again, researchers um, studied how, they, how the, the existing plant worked and came up with a design for a new plant. Okay, so that's very quick. Um, I would encourage you, if you want to know more, to visit our website. And if you look for the case study option in the drop down menu, it will take you to um, bunch of case studies that explain the, I guess, the, the diversity of projects that we've been involved with. Um, and hopefully you'll find that interesting. Gosh, I don't know, was that 10 minutes? That was uh, very quick, but I hope that's given you some insight into kind of where we come from and uh, what we've done. Perfect. Thank you very much, Jonathan, and thanks for um, yeah stepping in there quickly. Um, if you're able to just stop sharing your presentation, um, we're hopefully going to pick up back with Michael where we left off. Um, so I'll just get back to his slides and um, over to you, Michael, if you're able to join us again. And I hope you can hear me again now. Yeah, we can. Thank you. I need to ask Jonathan to see if he can help remanufacture a broadband router for us. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> so just to pick up where we left off, um, so we're looking at uh, recirculation and <clears throat> the actual practical process of uh, refurbishing parts. Um, for us, traceability is key. We uh, serialize any incoming parts so we can uh, monitor types of failure uh, and any unusual failures in the parts are traced right through the process and serialize an output. So not only does that uh, help to notice trends of failure, but it also means if we ever have a warranty claim in future, we know where that part's come from, uh, which customer it's gone to, uh, and we can uh, quickly identify if there are any uh, links there. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the pictures you see in this uh, slide are actually taken from projects with both the Advanced Material Research Lab and with the Department of Manufacturing, Engineering and Management at the University of Strathclyde. Um, this was actually two different parts of one project, uh, one part looking at uh, the material composition uh, of a specific part, 
the, the second half of the project, which was EMEM, was looking at the specific dimensions and cause of failure. Um, we find that the recirculation of parts, um, the, uh, the real pinch point can be uh, the research that goes into backing a warranty and making sure the customer is happy that what they get is good as new. I think the research is the, uh, underpins all of that and gives customer confidence in what they're buying. Uh, next slide, please. So capability-wise, as you can see, we've got a uh, We've got a number of components for a number of turbine types that we already refurbish. Uh, the majority of what you see here is done in-house, but we do have a, a, a list of subcontractors as partners who uh, do any specialist equipment uh, or anything that needs some kind of specialist pass off or test. Um, between ourselves and our third party contractors, we, we cover a wide range of components and turbine types. Um, we're also moving to a new premises early in the new year, which will be four to five times the size of where we are to deal with the increased volume. Uh, I think we outgrew our current facility within three months of moving in, so uh, that'll be a welcome change. Next slide, please. Uh, key to the, uh, the whole refurbishment process is the partnership. So we've got a number of partnerships, whether they're academic uh, funding partners, uh, but also our customers and our suppliers uh, we form partnerships with. As you can see here, there are a number of uh, bodies that we deal with. We, we've dealt a lot with HIE since the business started up in Loch Ilpid, um, and we still have a, a base in Loch Ilpid. We've got a lot of correspondence with HIE. Uh, we also had funding from Zero Waste Scotland. Um, but <clears throat> through uh, the University of Strathclyde, we've dealt a lot with AFRC, DMEM, and AMRL. Uh, and most of those projects were funded by the Scottish Remanufacture. Um, also on there is the uh, uh, Circular Glasgow Initiative. Uh, I'm an ambassador for Circular Glasgow, and there's quite a lot going on there at the moment. Next slide, please. And then finally, just uh, what I wanted to say was uh, about leading by example. So I think because we are uh, promoting ourselves as creating a sort of your economy within the wind industry, I think we have to uh, be sending the right message to our customers and our uh, suppliers. So we, we monitor uh, scrap and waste that's recirculated uh, so that, that avoids landfill and scrap. Um, it looks like we're on target for around about 40 so far this year when we get to the end of this month, uh, and we're aiming for around about 75 tonnes by the time we get to the end of the financial year. <clears throat> we also have the uh, been champions training, which uh, a few of us have carried out within the refurbishment centre in Lake but also the overall business. Uh, some of the others within the business at the, the warehouse have been doing the Bean champions training as well. So it's a, not just a, a refurbishment centre initiative. Uh, and we also have other initiatives like uh, water harvesting, and we, we monitor water and electricity consumption and take part in various events, speaking uh, STEM events at uh, colleges. Uh, I think that's about it, uh, other than question and answer, so uh, or to anybody's question. Thanks, Michael. That's great. Technology worked for us in the end, so that's fantastic. Uh, I just have a one question for Michael, one for Jonathan, and then I think Heather's going to go through the questions that have come up through the chat function. Um, Michael, firstly, sorry for saying repair and remanufacture. I think at the start of this journey back in 2016, there was the, the question of whether repair might be a way forward. But of course, as you're, you're saying, it's not at all what you do, it's remanufacture. So just along that line, how have you found that you have worked on consumer confidence for um, demanding uh, or buying refurbished parts as opposed to from you? Well, <clears throat> as you say, repair is the first choice. Repair is certainly the smallest carbon footprint. So but repair, I would say, should be seen as the uh, the customer or the, the service company uh, carrying out a repair within the turbine uh, and the part not leaving the turbine. Uh, mm -hmm. I think refurbishment uh, really requires, uh, well, it has to be refurbishment to be scalable. I think mm -hmm. I think if we're looking at individual repairs on parts, then well, it's got 200 turbines in one uh, site mm -hmm. uh, and we're looking mm -hmm. at eight units per turbine, mm -hmm. it's a significant volume. So uh, in order to, to get that over the line, I think there are a few customers they needed the added uh, ability that came with support from 
a, the various departments of the University of Strathclyde from our other partnerships. I think uh, we really needed that, uh, that additional knowledge to back up uh, the refurbishments we were carrying out. I think there's a, there's a learning curve for every refurbishment where you, you get to know what it is that fails. Uh, and you know you might add that to the bill of materials as a part which replaced the standard um, but you also need to, to gather as much information as possible in order to uh, ensure that what you put back is as good as new. Okay that's great thank you Michael. Uh, Jonathan can I just ask you as well you talked about the importance of knowledge exchange and of course we, we emphasise that on interface as well this is a two-way process it's not just everything being learnt from the university it's the university or the the Institute, it's what can be learnt back from the company. What do you feel that you've learnt from this collaboration with Renewable Parts? Um, I th think it's the one part of the brief was not just to um, come up, you know, identify a problem, but come up with a solution that they could use in their own facility. Okay, so it's fine in the university where you've got, you know, let's say state of the art measurement equipment. Um, but how could you implement that if you're in Loch Gilpet? You know, you didn't have a, you know, a, a temperature controlled, you know, environment for measuring the size of things. So um, I think that encouraged us to think outside the box, you know, and we were eventually able to um, identify that the surface hardness um, around some of the, uh, the machined features uh, were, would, would reflect um, how stressed the metal was. Um, but that was, you know, uh, we would never have uh, explored those thoughts, you know, in a normal um, academic environment. We would have stopped at the, you know, having identified the problem was uh, that it was, uh, that the, the stress was too high, we would have stopped. Um, so it was, it was the, the challenge of finding a solution that could be implemented in a, um, let's say, a, a a practical environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's good. And it probably backs up to that location's no issue. So in terms of where a company might be, the support can be provided from, you know, an institute far away because the the elements are taken into consideration when you do the project. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Heather. I'll hand over to you. I think there's a few questions to be answered, so I'll let you cover them. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so I guess we've got the first question coming in, and I guess renewable parts is one great example of this already. But um, what are you aware of um, other remanufacturing that's maybe happening in the Highlands and Islands region? Um, I don't know who's most appropriate to answer that. Jonathan, I guess it, from any of the case studies that you provided, are you supporting any other um, businesses? No, but I would make the comment that the nearly the only industry sector that calls themselves remanufacturing manufacturers are the automotive sector you know so renewable parts is an exception in the the wind turbine industry who you know who say we are a remanufacturer but you find remanufacturing going on under other names all over the place so in the highlands i would um, sus suspect that there's agricultural machinery being remanufactured i would suspect that there's um marine, uh, there's overhaul of uh, fishing boats and um, offshore equipment. Um, you know, I think it goes on, but probably if you search for a remanufacturer, you know, Fort William or Ullapool, you won't find anything. It's the smaller scale operations where people are, you know, refurbishing, um, but, you know, looked at with other eyes, you would call them remanufacturers. But maybe uh, Michael's got has some specific uh, examples? You know, I, I would echo that. I think there's a, until it's until it's scaled up, it's hard to really notice these businesses doing these sort of things. But I think it's happening all the time. I think the likes of the fish farm industry in the west coast of Scotland, there's very small companies doing really great things uh, in order to uh, you know the uh, farms they uh, operating, um, but it's stuff that doesn't really get publicised really off the radar, I would say, until it's, until it's scaled up into something that we're actually selling as a product. Great, thank you both. Um, so I've got another question come in that um, asks around, um, have manufacturers embraced remanufacturing and um, helping by providing and drawing on the production information, um, or have you had to reverse engineer all of the solutions? 
don't know if that's something for yourself, Jonathan. Well, I'll let Michael, um, Michael, comment on the reverse engineering um, thing. I'd say, uh, yeah, I think I think the uh, quick answer would be no. I think the vast majority of the uh, parts we look at, we deal with the OOEM, uh, the original manufacturer of the equipment. Um, it's very hard to get drawings. It's very hard to get part uh, numbers. Anything. Um, a lot of the stuff uh, protected for the the wind turbine manufacturer. Um, so a lot of reverse engineering does have to go on, and that's where collaboration with academic institutions is really key. Because we we as the size of this business, we couldn't afford to have an R and D department. Uh, but it might be if we can project specific enough, we can you know put a proposal together to SIR for a fairly small project that helps to identify a part, or, you know, reverse engineer a part. Um. I would, let's say a couple of things. So there are some very large companies um, who have totally uh, got on board with the idea of remanufacturing, um, possibly from, not from environmental uh, or sustainability motivations, but from purely economic ones. So there's a diesel engine manufacturer, global one, um, and a household name who, you know, if you take your your diesel engine to them, uh, they'll say they'll try. I'll offer to sell you a new one or a remanufactured one. And the reason that they do all the remanufacturing is they want to keep you within their ecosystem. They don't want you to going off seeing independent suppliers. So they've got factories almost as large as the ones making the new products that are also remanufacturing because they can see the, you know, they would ra rather sell these then um, allow other people to to have access to their market um, there are other original equipment manufacturers who have subcontract uh, arrangements so some of the car companies have contractual arrangements with remanufacturing outfits and say okay you do all you know ford or Bergeau or whoever's remanufacturing um, and Again, that, that's a symbiotic relationship. They get access to the, the drawings and the materials and that sort of thing. Um, however, those are, those are still exceptions. Um, oh, and the other commercial example, I think there's a bicycle company um, who are trying to move, who are trying to launch a new bicycle for children. That's a remanufactured, designed to be remanufactured from the outset. So it lasts a, a hundred years. And really you rent this bicycle rather than buy it. And they take it back, they remanufacture it, and they, they sell it back to the market. But these are exceptions. The vast majority of uh, remanufacturers, I think, are independent of the people who originally made the equipment. Um, and often they're just using their own skill and knowledge and um, experience to remanufacture the components with you know, no cooperation or uh, information from the original manufacturer. So, um, you know, it's it's there's still there's still a, a a moment to come. I think when the large companies realise that they there is a market there and that they can uh, that they could benefit from engaging with remanufacturing. Definitely, thanks, Jonathan. A lot to think about. Yeah, within all of that. Um, Another question's come in uh, around, I guess this might be one for you, Michael, um, around the role of refurbishment in reducing the carbon intensity of wind turbines. Uh, yeah, so I think that's exactly where we're at just now. With, um, the likes of the parts we refurbish uh, monthly um, are all parts that until now had been uh, scrapped and bought new. Um, so at the moment we're recirculating a been seven and ten tons per month of material that had been scrapped and then bought new. Um, so from that, we we can then draw down, you know, the equivalent uh, CO two saving of a uh, you know the production of that steel um, just by weight. Uh, there's a lot there's a lot going on in uh, these areas. There's a lot of reverse engineering going on, especially in the main gearboxes and generators of wind turbines. But I think. When you get to the smaller component parts, which are still, you know, possibly a few hundred kilos each, uh, there's a lot of parts at the moment that are still 
uh, going to waste and scrap that, that shouldn't really be. Um, I think even in some scenarios, they are they are recirculated, but uh, possibly via uh, the OEM back in Denmark or Germany. So it's not really a great saving on uh, CO two emissions if we're sending the stuff all that way. So I think I think for the real circular economy, you really need to be fairly local uh, for the stuff traveling back and forward and not sending the stuff too far afield. Great, thanks, Michael. Um, and I might bring you in here, Lorraine. Um, we've had a question just following up to the Highlands and Islands question, just around Highlands and Islands enterprise are involved, um, I guess, in the support of businesses, in the support of the region. Um, so I don't know if you could give a bit of background on that, Lorraine, and also just kind of how maybe interface work with Highlands and Islands enterprise as well. Well, Highlands and Islands Enterprise are really a partner in Interface. They provide us um, funding along with Scottish Enterprise and our main funder, which is Scottish Funding Council. So we work very, very closely with Highlands and Islands Enterprise. They provide us our office space. So three of us are actually based in Inverness uh, covering the region. Um, there is going to be a new Make It Smart hub, which has uh, just been launched within the region. And I don't know, Jonathan, if you're aware of that's looking at remanufacture. That's something I'm not 100% sure about. But certainly that is for construction, manufacturing and high are a partner in that, along with Construction Scotland Innovation Centre, um, UHI, University of Highlands and Islands, and also Data Lab and Census. So I think there looks to be something there particularly tailored to the region. Um, but as I've said earlier, the, the good thing is that the resources are available further south as well as within the Highlands and Islands to do this work. And you've heard from the, the good work there of uh, Scottish Institute for Remanufacture. Uh, so high in terms of supporting that new hub, yes, but also, of course, they support their account managed companies. They also support infrastructure. So there are various options there in relation to how, how high can support a company. And I suppose it's really a case of, of just tapping into that resource there. But they're certainly very keen to look at um, productivity is a key, key thing for the economy just now, and that's across all kinds of manufacturing, big or small, uh, and I'm sure that they're willing to try and support as much as they can. Thanks, Lorraine. And I guess just thinking about, um, with yourself, Jonathan, just how, I guess, the Scottish Free Manufacturing um, Institute works with High and the support that you get from them. Yeah, we uh, don't, most of our support comes through zero waste. So, um, it, you know, occasionally we get people redirected to us from from high, but um, uh, I don't think we have any direct funding from them. But I, I, in commenting on uh, what Lorraine just said, I'd just say there's another example of an industry that didn't call themselves remanufacturers, but have discovered they are, you know, the construction industry, of course, we all live in, oh, sorry, many people live in remanufactured houses, you know, and we don't think twice about uh, reusing a building. Uh, and so the construction industry has got a huge scope for not just recycling, but remanufacturing. And, you know, that's a, the terminology is creeping into that industry. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, I also just wanted to pick up on a point with you, Michael. Um, one of the questions we had drafted was, um, you know, why you had sought academic expertise. But I think you'd already mentioned that with, you know, talk about outsourcing and having not having an R&D department in-house. Um, did you find that the relationship with um, the Scottish Institute of Remanufacture and other academic partners have offered you more than you expected? Uh, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, I think I think when we started to deal with the uh, academic partners, we were always be, uh, quite apprehensive, thinking that it would take a long time to get things moving uh, and it would be really slow to respond uh, as the project progressed. Uh, Jonathan making a face there, but luckily that wasn't. <laughs> but that luckily that wasn't the case. We found found the whole project progressed. Uh, it was very dynamic. We got halfway through the project, the goalposts moved slightly for us as a business, um, which is what you expect with a small business. You know, the goalposts move month to month, um, and you know a, a few things changed. It started out as a project. We're looking at uh, how we could identify weaknesses in uh, a certain component, but by the end of the project, we were planning to reverse engineer and produce that component and the work that the university were doing went from inspection techniques for prevention failure to inspection techniques for our new finished product we were going to have to do anyway so it's something that uh, you know the the project just moved with a requirement from our end so it was really quite refreshing to see the uh, 
way things could just change. Great, thanks for that, Michael. That's, um, yeah, really good to hear on, on behalf of that. Um, and I guess just a question to put to both of you, um, and a big one to end on, is how you see the importance of circular economy on climate change. Yeah, I'm happy to go first on that. So I, mean, I, think, <laughs> uh, I guess it's crucial. I guess it's um, it, it's a really credible way of, you know industrially decarbonizing you know so we will always need new products um but you know the the scope for reuse not so much in, in industry honestly if you know if you look at the north sea and look around aberdeen there's already large numbers of companies refurbishing and remanufacturing valves and pumps and you know heavy equipment i think that the challenge for remanufacturing is consumer you know we you know, we people buy secondhand cars, but number of people buying, um, you know, re refurbished washing machines or fridges or, you know, other consumer appliances, um, it's very small. So I think there's a this opportunity to to grow this, you know, to make it attractive. You know, so you know, so it's no longer, you know, so remanufactured products are perhaps sold at a premium because they're saving energy and carbon and, you know, doing less environmental damage. So maybe the same way that organic food costs more than, you know, mass produced food, um, you know, remanufactured consumer products will carry the same premium because of their, but that's, you know, that's a marketing challenge, but I do, I think it's a, it's a, an essential, it's not the whole answer, but it's a, an essential contributor to the answer. I fully agree with that. I think uh, I would say climate change has been a real buzz phrase for uh, some time now, for a number of years, but I think we're just at the tipping point with circular economy now. Um, I think big businesses are really starting to wake up, and I think um, that uh, businesses that are guilty of sort of greenwashing or uh, being held to account more by customers. I think there's a greater awareness uh, in the public and with uh, the likes of our customers, they, they know what they're looking for. You know, you can tell now if a business is uh, just saying they're doing the right thing or if they're actively doing the right thing. Um, so I think there's, there's going to be a huge change uh, over the next few years in particular. Businesses that fail to get on board and embrace that uh, very quickly fall behind and be held to account. Great. Right, well, yeah, thank you very much, both um, Jonathan and Michael, and contributing, I guess, to, to that discussion on, yeah, where this conversation relates to and, um, you know, the conversation around COP26 that year that there is to come. So I think there'll be lots going on in Scotland around that conversation um, and lots of action happening, um, which is great. And it's really nice as well to hear how well Renewable Parts is doing at the moment and looking across all different areas of the business. And I think both yourself, Jonathan and Michael, you've picked up on what can be done around looking at business models and tools and looking at different areas of the business. So definitely lots of scope for um, people within daily lives, but also within their professional lives at how their businesses are run to kind of pick up on potential projects and um, how they can do things a bit differently. Um, I do have a comment from one of the um, attendees that I'll just mention, which is quite nice. It says his mother always used to use the word thrift. So how can we all do better and how can we learn from your story in our daily lives? So that's quite a nice um, little quote to end on um, and I guess if there's something as well that you think um, you know if there is a project within your business that you think either a university or interface could help out on um, from what we've discussed today if it's inspired any thoughts inspired any thinking um, then we are here to help um, so if you would like to get in touch with interface or you would like to follow up with any of our speakers um, as I said we'll be sharing a webinar online um, with all of our contact details um, and yeah, if you have anything that you'd like to get in contact and just kind of discuss potential options, then feel free to let us know. But I'd just like to say a big thank you to Michael and Jonathan for your presentations today. Some yeah, really interesting views um, put forward and great to hear how um, yeah, your collaborations have been going and to have a catch up around that. It's been really good. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you very much to Lorraine and all the attendees as well. Thank you. <laughs>